of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of our social media community. We're so glad to welcome all of you brothers and sisters online. What a joy to have all of you in the service today. We also want to welcome the Akwai Bomb State community connected to the service right now by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Akwai Bomb, Passion FM, Inspiration FM, and Heritage FM. We truly want to welcome all of you to the service. Do me the favor of calling a friend, a loved one, and a family member. Ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. Our social media community, let's get this word, the truth of Christ, to the ends of the earth. It's so critical that we do that. Help me share the video. Join as many groups as 50, 100. Put the messages there. Let's lighten the dark places of the earth. We want to welcome all our campuses around the world, brothers and sisters in different countries that are connected to the service right now. We love all of you and it's a joy to have all of you in fellowship today. Are we excited to be here for the word? If you're excited about the word, can we celebrate the word of God with a shout? Glory! Amen! Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, with your phone. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self this morning. Glory to God forevermore. Uh -uh -uh. All right, so in the first service, we laid a number of things as foundation. I will truly recommend for you to get the, this message of the first service. It will give you a lot of understanding as to the kind of foundation we already laid in the first service to help you understand most of the things I will be saying in this service. We've been examining Brother Paul's revelation of identification. And the signature of the Pauline, uh, Pauline theology is in Christ. In Christ. And uh, we've been on this for quite a few weeks now. And we will still be looking at this subject for another few weeks. You know, just uh, trying to make sure we bring you to a place of clarity and understanding. All right, so the book of Second Peter, chapter 3, verse number 15. Let's see an apostle of repute what he says about the Pauline theology. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is soteria. The word salvation is a word for soteria. Soteria is the Greek salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom, the word sophia, taken from the word sophizo, according to the wisdom, the sophia, the insight, given to him hath written unto you. Next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, not impossible, but hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So we began to examine the wisdom that was given to brother Paul, and we began to see how that the Pauline theology is in tandem with Jesus' theology. That brother Paul taught the same things Jesus taught and he was faithful to Jesus. We also established that Jesus' theology was from Moses' theology. Because in Luke chapter 24 verse number 27, Jesus was teaching the disciples after his resurrection and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. So Jesus taught from Moses' teaching notes. Jesus taught from Moses' theology. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now also observe what Jesus will say about what Moses wrote about him. In John chapter 5, verse 46. John chapter 5, verse 46. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Next verse. But if you believe not his writings... How shall you believe my words? Moses wrote of Christ. So Moses' theology was Christocentric, Christ-centered. So when Jesus, who is God, who became a man in the incarnation, showed up, he just took Moses' teaching notes and brought out the things concerning himself from what Moses taught in the Torah or in the Old Testament. When you see the word scripture, he's referring to Genesis to Malachi. The scriptures. So Jesus taught from the scriptures. And then brother Paul shows up. Brother Paul. Now, before brother Paul, look at John 16, 12. <clears throat> John chapter 16, verse number 12. Jesus is giving his last public lecture. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. 
Next verse. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. He will guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever you, he will guide you. So whatever you, there's a syntax problem there. Whatever you shall hear, that shall you speak. Then he will show you, the spirit will show you things to come. That's the way it is in the original. Now, so Jesus said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. Which means his mode of communication will be such that he is not able to say many things because of the limitation of their capacity to comprehend what he was going to be saying. Then he now says, post-resurrection, the spirit will come. When the spirit comes, the spirit will guide you into all of the truth concerning what I want to say to you that you cannot bear them now from what Moses said in the scriptures. Remember, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So there is consistency of theology. Moses is teaching notes concerning Christ. Christ took what Moses taught, highlighted them in parables, and told of the spirit coming that will open up the whole truth. So now the spirit post-resurrection is given to the apostles. And the apostles took Jesus' teaching notes, which is Moses' teaching notes, to teach us doctrine for the New Testament church. Now stay with me because I'm going to get in some things. In the book of John, chapter 16, verse 7. <clears throat> John, chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart... I will send him unto you. This is Jesus talking about the comforter. The comforter, if I depart, I will send him unto you. John chapter 14, verse number 26. John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. So now he explains to you who the comforter is. Which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the comforter is the Holy Ghost. Look at that John chapter 14 verse 17. John 14 17. Even the spirit of truth, that's the comforter. That's another comforter. The Greek word for pneuma aletia. Pneuma aletia. The spirit of truth. Numa spirit aletia of truth. Okay, even the numa aletia, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you post resurrection and shall be in you. He dwelleth with you. <laughs> oh my. Emmanuel. God with. And shall be in. Numa Aletia. Now, stay with me. Next verse. So that it will be clear. Next verse. 18. John 14, 18. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are not seeing it. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come. You didn't see. Let's go back to the previous verse. Verse 17. Pay attention. Verse 17. John 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, Post-resurrection, he shall be in you. Next, further explanation. Next verse. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come. I will come to you. 
So the spirit of truth is Jesus himself. He is the new man, Aletia. Observe verse 20, so that we get clearer. Verse 20 of John 14. At that day, post-resurrection, you shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. Is it getting clear? I in you. Now, so their minds were opened because after Jesus taught them in Luke 24 verse 27, I mean 25 to 27, in verse 45, then opened he their understanding, dinogio, that they might sune me, that they might understand the scriptures. So their understanding was split open for the first time and they remained in that understanding. All right, Sunemi means a collection of facts together to bring out the meaning. So when Jesus put the facts together, their minds were open to the meaning. So therefore, their use of heaven, the apostles' use of heaven, was Jesus' use of heaven. Because Jesus used heaven the way Moses used it. In Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Heaven and earth, therefore, was used for the invisible and visible. The Oranios in the Greek. So therefore, heaven and earth now becomes a Bible language for explaining the invisible on earth. For explaining the invisible on earth. Heaven and earth therefore becomes a shorthand or, yes, of talking about man in two dimensions or man in two worlds. Heaven and earth therefore becomes a phrase descriptive of operations on the earth. The same way the heavens where we fly jets and birds fly is still within the earth sphere. The same way heaven and earth refers to where man is in heaven on earth. Man, the man that is born of God is in heaven on earth right now. The question now will be which heaven? So it's a way of speaking and because of the word we now say the heavens in Moses' teaching which is Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Put it up for me. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Hebrew reads it at Barashit. And I gave you the spelling of Barashit. Elohim Barat. Et Shamayim's letter Aret. That's the Hebrew. It means in the beginning, Barashit, God Elohim. Barat created the Shamayims, the Shamayims, the heavens, letter Aret, and the earth. The word Shamayims, I told you, is from Shena in the, in the Hebrew. Shena means lofty, high. Shena means invisible. Shena means way above. And that is how Jesus uses it. So there are words like that where the moment you see them, you cannot afford but go literal. You only use the literal to understand the meaning. You use the literal to understand the meaning. Of course, when you say heaven, the next thing everybody does is to look up to the sky. When it is said that Jesus looked up into heaven, as though he looked into the sky. But it's not literal the way you're looking at it. The same way the Bible says, and Stephen looked and the heavens were opened. It's not literal. Because if it was literal, everybody there should have seen the same thing Stephen was seeing. So it was not literal. Your, your need, you know, your mind is being challenged because of CRK. That's why your mind is being challenged. And then there was a book, I was talking with Pastor Praise about it this morning. I won't call the name of the church, but there was this yellow book. They call it my book of Bible story. That book has done more havoc to the people of God than anything else. 
Because a lot of theology came from that book of Bible st stories. And the people that published it made sure it was all over. Every family you go, that is where they garnered their theology from. And the theology of that book is work. It's work. It is not Bible at all. So most of this heaven, heaven theology will make heaven at last. Heaven is a planet somewhere. We're going to travel there using maybe aeroplanes or something. All that is total work. It's not Bible. The Bible, listen carefully. The Bible is not an English book. The Bible has a language and has explanation of its own language. That's what we call exegesis. Exegesis simply means to stay within the context of scripture and let the scripture define what it is saying in its usage of words. That's why sometimes when I teach you, we do word study. We take a word, we see how it was applied all over the place in a corroboration to arrive at the scriptural meaning of that word, then apply it in the context to really pull out what the context is saying. Now that's a lot of work, but that's what Bible teaching is about. Bible teaching is about being able to go to the mind of the author and see what the author actually meant when he said what he said. Because the Bible can never mean today what it never meant when it was first written. Meaning you cannot change the meaning of scripture to suit your present circumstances. That will be immoral and that will be an abuse of the scriptures. Now, so but when you get to Peter... Jesus will say something like, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. But my father which is in heaven. Flesh and blood therefore becomes a shorthand. You know in the first service we laid the foundation for shorthand. Heaven and earth therefore becomes a shorthand. For example, let's look at the word flesh and bones. So you know that language. Luke 24, 37 to 39. Luke 24, 37 to 39. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Flesh and bones. It means flesh and structure. Flesh and structure as you see me have. And that's literal. That word flesh and bones was repeated by Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 30. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So flesh and bones will now be humanity. Humanity. We are members of the new man. We are members of the new creation. We are members of his humanity. So flesh and bones will refer to humanity. Then we also have flesh and blood. Jesus used it in John chapter 6. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Again, humanity. Humanity. Because what saved us is his humanity. The humanity of Jesus saved us. Because the humanity of Jesus is death burial and resurrection and our salvation is predicated on the death the burial and the resurrection of Christ now eat my flesh drink my blood it doesn't mean drink my blood like open your mouth and suck my blood is a shorthand of saying my humanity is in my resurrection my humanity is in my resurrection. You know, you can come back and say, the spirit of the son. And you are saying the same thing. 
the spirit of the son. But when you use flesh and blood, it is to stress that it is human. But like I said, you can come back and say the spirit of his son. And you're saying the same thing. Only that your explanation is meant to achieve a different result in the mind of your listeners. So when he says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, he now says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. In John chapter 6, eat my flesh, drink my blood, that you may have life. But it is the spirit that quickeneth. So the flesh and the blood is the spirit. Am I teaching? Is the spirit that quickeneth. So his flesh and blood will refer to the spirit of God in his resurrection. So when he says, touch me, a spirit has no flesh and bones, literal. But when Paul now says, we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones, that's now humanity in his resurrection. But not if you see the bones of Jesus, you will see me. That's not what it means. It's a shorthand of saying we share in the new humanity of Jesus. Flesh and bones or flesh and blood. We are partakers of the new humanity. The new kind of humanity that Jesus brought about as a result of his resurrection. So it's a way of speaking. Again, remember, Peter acknowledged that they say Sophia. There's an insight. Just like Jesus said, if a city does not receive you when you go to preach, shake off the dust of your feet. I do not expect you to go somewhere and they reject you from preaching and you start doing like this. No, no, no. It's a mode of speaking. Okay? What he's saying in other words is, if they reject you, let it be. Let them and go away. That's what he meant by shake the doors. He's not talking literal. He's using a figure to communicate. I don't know if I'm communicating at all. You know, like I've always said, in Bible interpretation, you must take note of, of word study. For example, today when it rains heavily, we say it rained cat and dogs. It rained cat and dogs. That's a form of speaking. In another 50 years, that may no more be in use. If I wrote a book today and I said, and while I was traveling, it rained cat and dogs on the way. There were even accidents on the way. In another 50 years, if somebody is reading my book, who does not understand cat and dogs raining? He will actually think that cat and dogs were falling from the sky till they caused accidents. It is somebody that is here today that is there at that time that will say, no, cat and dogs is a figure of speech. It's a mode of communication back in the days. That is the same way in Bible language, there are figures of speech used to communicate certain realities. That is why Peter is acknowledging that there's a Sophia there's a sophizo with which Paul communicated. And if you're not careful, you will rest with his language and you will get destroyed by not understanding what he was saying. If I'm teaching good, say I hear you. So that's why when we teach the Bible, we take time to break words like flesh and bones, like flesh and blood, which I just explained, like shake off the dust of your feet. So look at the words. And when Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13 also shook their feet, the Bible says they shook their feet, it means they said goodbye to the city, we proceed no further. So always know the terms. And when you hear flesh and bones, he's talking about the humanity of Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 16 verse 13 and 14. Matthew 16, 13 and 14. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Next verse. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Next verse. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, 
the son of the living God. Next verse. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood, meaning humanity. He's not talking about body, body and blood. Flesh and blood is a figure referring to humanity. Humanity has not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. If it's getting clear, can I have a good amen? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. The flesh and blood in this context is, in, is the body in its frail state. That is to say that this mortal body is not part of the kingdom. This mortal body is not part of the kingdom. That is why if Jesus tarries, you will die. If Jesus tarries, all of us here will die. Including myself. If Jesus doesn't, if the trumpet of God doesn't sound another 200 years, none of you will be here. We will all drop this body. Because this body is not meant to be eternal. So this body cannot inherit the kingdom. This body is not part of the kingdom. So that's why mortality will put on immortality. Because immortality is part of the kingdom. So this one has been paid for to be exchanged with the kingdom body. If I'm teaching good, say I hear you. That mortality put on an immortality is actually the rapture or what we call the resurrection of the dead. So this body is not part of the kingdom. That's why it gets diseased. That's why it gets weak. That's why it gets tired. And let me also say something to you. If you're here and you're still afraid of death, then you have not understood anything I'm teaching. You have not understood anything I'm teaching. If you're afraid of death, because when you understand the life you have in Christ, death becomes nothing. Death becomes nothing. And let me also say something to you. If, if brothers or sisters in Christ die, we don't cry hopelessly. No, we don't cry hopelessly. If a brother or sister dies, we rejoice. Why do we rejoice? They are heaven's gain. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Do you cry for gain? You rejoice. That's counterculture. But the Bible says we do not sorrow with the world. The world sorrow because there's no hope. We do not sorrow because if a brother dies, he only slept. He only made progress. He only dropped this mortality waiting to wear the immortal body and he's not lost. He's still where we are. It's just that in this body we cannot communicate. But the moment this body changes, we shall be reunited. I don't know if I'm teaching somebody here. Let me also give you a second reason why you cannot afford to cry and be wailing as if you're hopeless. If a brother or a sister dies, if you get hopeless and you cry and act like that's the end of life, you don't know Christ. It means your Christianity is vain. Because the reason why you are lamenting like that is because you do not believe that there is resurrection. Because if you believe there is resurrection, you will not wail, you will not be hopeless and depressed. Because you know that this brother only dropped this body to wear the other one not too long. Do you cry that your child got admission to go to school in Australia? Huh? Full scholarship? And will be paid salary by the government? What do you do? Why are you rejoicing? Huh? Because that's gain. And that child may not see you again. There are people that have gone abroad to school that never came back again. 
That child may never see you again, yet you are rejoicing. You are going around. My child just got admission in Australia. School fees fully paid for by government. They are even paying my child's salary. Oh, God, you are so good. Oh, wonderful. But you won't see that child again. That child is gone, yet you are not crying. So dying is the same. The person went to a better location. This time around, not sponsored. This time he's gone home. Where all of us will go. Except you have no hope in Christ. We don't cry. If we cry, it will just be minimal because we feel the absence. But not hopeless. There are two different things. They say crying because you feel absence and they say hopeless cry. Where you get into depression, where you begin to say, oh man, of things, God, are you still there? Just because, just because one person in your family has gone to be with God, you're questioning whether God is still there, then you don't even know God. You don't even know God. I told you, a brother in this church sent for me and said, Papa, I'm sending for you because I've decided to go. Pastor Shadrach is here. I was with you that day. We were together. The brother sent for me, so I told Pastor Shadrach, the district pastor, come, let's go. We are in the room, and the man says, Papa, thank God you came. I sent for you to thank you for the things you have taught me. Now I know what it means to be in Christ. Now I know where I am going. I have decided to go. I've never had that in all my life. He said, I'm done with this world. Right now, I want to see Jesus. So I sent, I will have gone before you came, but I wanted to register my gratitude. You have taught me Christ. I'm sitting, I'm looking at him. He's not worried, he's smiling. His wife is there. I'm going. I call you to pray and dismiss me. Pastor Praise, how do you pray that kind of prayer? Because I've never seen it prayed in the Bible. So I don't have a scripture to pray that kind of prayer. And he's not joking. So I now look at him and I said, so you will see brother Paul before me. He smiled. He said, yes, Papa. I will see Brother Paul before you. We will be sharing fellowship before you come. <laughs> no cry. So I don't know how to pray the prayer. <laughs> so I just say, Father, thank you for our brother. As he has decided to depart and be with you, we rejoice. We pray for his family that they be comforted. And after the prayer, I said to him, so you mean after now like this, we will meet at the other side? He said, yes. I said, okay. I'm, I'm leaving you now. We'll see you in the morning. That was in the night. So you remember, he said, no, Papa, I won't be here in the morning. He thought tomorrow morning. He said, I won't be here in the morning. So I said, no, not morning tomorrow, morning in the resurrection. So he smiled. He said, yes, Papa, we'll see in the resurrection. And I left. A few days after, he was gone. He decided to, see, when you understand the import of being in Christ and the import of salvation, those things don't threaten you anymore. You're not frightened. Brother Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Then after a while, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord Jesus will give to me and to all those who love his appearing. Then he now says, I am ready to depart. He too said, I made up my mind to go. What about Stephen? They stoned Stephen, stoned Stephen. Stephen now said, okay, Father, just forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. The saints of old gave up their ghost. They didn't take it from them. Even Jesus gave up his ghost. Which means for men to leave this world will be deliberate by their choice. By their choice. Sometimes we are in faith. Father, this brother cannot die. This brother cannot die. We stand in faith. We refuse you death. The brother has decided to go. He just doesn't want to argue with you. You are the one praying. He's the one going. You finish your prayer. He still goes. Father, why? <laughs> why? Did you know what him and God have settled? A guy died and the wife was praying. Father, my husband is not going to go. Oh, God, I need him here. I need him here. The man died. The woman kept praying. Then the man came back. As soon as he stood up from his the true story, he told her, what's your problem? What's your problem? This world is dirty. I was already in my rest. But you won't let me go. 
See, and Jesus told me, your wife won't let you go. Go back. He said, told her, look, the next time I leave, the next time I leave, don't pray that your prayer because I will not cooperate. He stayed with her for a few months and he went. And she didn't pray again because he warned her. Ladies and gentlemen, what we are doing here is not a joke. This is reality. Somebody shout, I am in Christ. Say, my hope is not in this world. My hope is Christ. He lives in me. Shout glory, somebody. So, brother Paul is saying, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why our bodies will be changed. All right, now. Galatians 1.16, brother Paul said, I coffered not with flesh and blood, means I did not confer with man. So it's a shorthand of saying man, Short, shorthand of saying man, flesh and blood, flesh and bones. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, Ephesians chapter 6 verse number 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, humanity, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high. Not places, in high. The interesting thing is that what you're wrestling against is not humanity, but it is inside humanity. You are not wrestling against people. There is something in people that controls them to do the things they do to hurt you. And what you're wrestling against is not the people, flesh and blood. It is that thing in them. But Paul calls it the spirit that walketh in the children of disobedience. There's a spirit at work in them. There's a spirit at work in people that are not born again. So it means it's not what I see. So when Paul said flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, what it means is that it's what we're saying or what we're seeing in your physical body. That your physical body is not a part of the kingdom. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Okay? Now, look at that First Corinthians chapter 15, 51. Behold, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Since this body cannot inherit the kingdom, therefore, it will be changed. Because the only body that will inherit the kingdom is the immortal body, which Christ has prepared for everyone that is born again. Because your body, this one, has been bought with a price. God owns it in Christ. Therefore, since it is owned by God, God has decided that it is not fit because this body does not have what it takes to be eternal. So it will be changed with the immortal one that is a part of eternity. This is what Brother Paul's soonest was about. Now, stay with me. So it's a short way of saying things. So therefore, when you see the word heaven or heaven and earth or heaven itself, it's a description of that part of man that is not seen. That is not seen. Look at Matthew chapter 5 verse number 48. Matthew chapter 5 verse number 48. Is somebody getting blessed? Matthew chapter 5, verse number 48. <clears throat> Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, 
is perfect. You will be perfect as your own father which is in heaven. Of course, that's one of the things he said as if it has happened. But it was to happen. You will only be perfect upon his resurrection. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray. Pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When he said that, where was the Father? Huh? When he said, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Where was the father? Huh? On earth where? In Christ. So that means the father in heaven was in Christ with them. <laughs> it is good. The father in heaven was in Christ with them. Somebody say, what do you mean? The father's dwelling is Christ. The father and Christ are never separated. I am my father. So wherever Christ is, the father is. Wherever the father is, Christ is. So when he say, pray our father which is in heaven, he means our father which is in me because Christ is the father's heaven. Somebody say, can you prove it? Many. Let's look at brother Paul's verbiage, which makes things clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. Can we all read together, everybody? Let's go, one to go. And all things are of God, who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and had given unto us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. All right, next verse. To wit, that God was where? That God was where? That God was where? Doing what? So when Christ was reconciling the world, where was God? So when Christ said, pray our father which is in heaven, where will be the father? So where will be heaven? So when you got into Christ, where did you get into? When we say heaven is a way of communicating the invisible. Have you ever seen where fathers live different from their children? Fathers live where their children are. So if the father is your father and is in heaven, of course, you are in heaven with him. Again, he used the word heaven for the unseen, which is the kingdom of God among the people he was talking to. Look at John chapter 3 verse 13. Please pay attention. John chapter 3 verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven... <laughs> No man has traveled to heaven. So heaven is not a travel. We are not traveling. Man doesn't travel to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which was in heaven. So if he's in heaven... And he is among men. Then where is heaven? Among men. Will that be a planet or an invisible reality? Very good. So heaven is not a planet. Heaven is an invisible reality of God in men. In men. That's why the preaching of heaven at last is fraud. Is religious fraud. 
the preaching of heaven at last is religious fraud. Praying to make heaven is religious fraud. You made heaven when you got born again. Except a man be born of water, which is the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. How do you enter? By being born again. So when you got born again, where did you enter? You entered the kingdom of heaven. So right now, where are you? You are in heaven. Even the son of man, which is in heaven. <laughs> so notice this. In all of the parables of Jesus, he wanted men to see what was in the heaven of God. In Jesus' parables, he wanted men to see what was in the kingdom or in the heaven of God. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse number 11. Matthew 13, 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysterion of the kingdom of heaven. The word mystery is mysterion. Of the kingdom of what? Of the kingdom of what? Of the kingdom of what? It is given to you to know the mystery of that which needs to be explained about the kingdom of heaven. But to them outside, it is not given. But to his disciples, it is given to know the mystery. Mystery means that which requires explanation about the kingdom of heaven. Now please stay with me. So Jesus' parables, he wanted men to see what was in the heaven of God. So he says, it is given to you to know the mysterion of the kingdom of heaven. To them, it is not given. What was the mysterion? He says, the word of God is sown. The word of God is sown. They on good ground are they who in an honest heart receive the word. And that is the explanation of the kingdom of heaven. What is the explanation, mystery of the kingdom? They who are on good ground, who in an honest heart Receive the word when it is preached. The word goes into their hearts and it brings forth fruit with patience. Then there are three different soils that the word does not enter. So heaven or the kingdom of heaven is the word of God in the heart of a man. The word of God in the heart of a man is the kingdom of heaven. The field is the heart. And he said the kingdom is likened unto. So the kingdom of heaven is in the heart. The word is sown in the heart of man, received in his heart. And when that word is received in the heart, that is the kingdom of heaven. That is the way Jesus spoke the Oranios. You know the Oranios and the Euphoranios. I took time to do work on that through the week. When we saw it the last time, look at John chapter 3 verse 3. He now says, and this is where the writings of Paul will help us out. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now remember we said, You will know heaven 
by the Euphoranius. You will know the Oranius by the Euphoranius. That is, you will know heaven by the things of that heaven. By the things of that heaven. The Euphoranius. The moment you know the things in that heaven, then you know where heaven is. The moment you know the things in that heaven, then you know where heaven is. Now look at the sequence. John 3.3 3, You cannot see the kingdom. John 3.5 Put it up. Let's read John 3.5 Everybody like a mask I want to go. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now remember, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, are they the same? They are interchangeably used. It is the kingdom of God because it is of God. It is the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of God is heaven. They don't mean different things. So the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, the king's domain, Basilia, the reign, the rule of God. Kingdom, Basilia, the rule of God. So, kingdom of heaven means the rule and the reign of God in the immaterial, which is in the heart of the believer. It's not a planet. Where you'll be singing, well, I'm going higher, yes I am. I'm going higher someday. I am going higher, yes I am. Going with Jesus to stay. I am going above the shadows into the presence of... You are the presence of God right now. You are the presence of God. Are you not the presence of God? So which presence are you going to enter? It came from my book of Bible story. That song. From some people they call something wickedness. Did I say anything? <laughs> the kingdom of God or born again. So Jesus now began to say, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Look at verse 6 and 7 of this scripture to help. 6 quickly. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Then he explains further verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Then look at verse 12. Oh, John 3, 8. The discourse continues. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? What are earthly things? Born of flesh. What are heavenly things? Born of the spirit. The things of that heaven, heaven will show you where heaven is. If I tell you earthly things, born of the flesh, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Born of of water which is symbolic of the spirit so to be born of the spirit is heavenly righteousness is heavenly adopted in Christ is heavenly accepted in Christ is heavenly forgiven is heavenly and all of that happens inside a man right now the things of that heaven shows you where that heaven is. Hey. 
If I tell you of the Euphoranius. So the spirit is the heaven of God. The spirit is the heaven of God. Notice the sequence. The spirit is the heaven of God. And Pastor prays. This heaven of God, which is the spirit, he later on in this same John chapter 3, verse 16, he calls it everlasting life. He calls it heavenly things. Then further explanation, he called born of the spirit, heavenly things, everlasting life. So when you have everlasting life, where are you? You are in heaven. So the spirit is the heaven of God. Now, why did brother Paul use heavenless? How many of you remember? When we saw the statistics, Paul used it just a few times. And then we said, when brother Paul uses Jesus' verbiage, either few times, it is because he has exchanged it. He has exchanged the word, the verbiage. So that word, heaven, brother Paul used it as spirit. So Paul used pneumaticos. For those of you making notes, pneuma, T-I-K-O-S. Pneuma, P-N-U-E-M-A, pneuma, ticos. He used pneumaticos together with Euphoranius. And for those of you making notes, Euphoranius is P-E-P-O-R-A-N-I-O-U-S. So that is spirit or that spirit is the heaven of God. Let's watch brother Paul's Euphoranius in a beautiful way. What does Paul call our physical body? He calls it heavenly. Yet in the previous letter to the Corinthian church, he said it is a life-giving spirit. So it's a spiritual body and that spiritual body is a body of the spirit. 1 Corinthians 15.44 Please pay attention. 1 Corinthians 15, 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Body. 45. As it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Last Adama. Adam, Adama, which is Christ. He is the last and the first begotten. He is the last and the first. He is the last Adama, the last humanity. No humanity after Jesus' is humanity. Jesus' humanity is the new creation. And in the new creation, he's the first begotten, the prototokos. He's the prototokos of the last Adama. Are we together? Prototokos means prototype. Prototype. That is, he's the model of all new creations. Now, for those of you that what I'm speaking sounds like Latin, you will need to go back and follow what I have taught from 2nd January till yesterday. Then what I'm teaching now will be easy. You know, um, as a church, our church is a school. We teach in curriculums. Because that's how Bible teaching is approached. This body he calls spiritual. Later on, in graduation of, of verbiage, 
Brother Paul now calls it heavenly. He calls it heavenly. Then in 2 Corinthians, we'll get there. So Paul's heavenly is Paul's pneumaticus. How does that sink without Jesus using it? Yes, Jesus. It sinks because Ephesians 1, 3. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Where are the spiritual blessings? In heavenly, the places is not in the original. In heavenly, in Christ. So heavenly is where? In Christ. The blessings are where? In heavenly. Heavenly is where? In Christ. So where is God's heaven? Christ. Where is the believer right now? In Christ. What is in Christ? In heaven. In heavenly. In Christ. With all pneumaticos. Holy jetties. You know pneumaticos? P-N-U. I mean P-N-E-U. M-A-T-I-K-O-S. Pneumaticos. Heologetis is H-E-U-L-O-G-E-T-I-S. In the Greek. Heologetis. Pneumaticos, heologetis. It means blessedness of the spirit. Blessings of the spirit. Pneumaticus heologetis. Somebody says, why do you use Greek and Hebrew? Because that's the original language in which the Bible was written before it was translated. And sometimes because grammar is progressive, our grammar loses the essence of what was said. So with today's English understanding, we go to the original to bring out the real interpretation of what the author intended. Now, the spirit is where? In Christ. In heavenly. He expects you to see that he uses those words interchangeably. Question. Is Jesus' kingdom in the spirit? Huh? Please, the radio audience needs to hear you. Huh? Yes. Okay. Is his kingdom in the spirit? So the things of the spirit are the heavenly things in the teaching of Jesus. Huh? So Paul's Euphorinus is Paul's pneumaticus. Huh? Paul's heavenly things are Paul's spirituals. Does it agree with Jesus? Exactly. There's a corroboration of explanation. There's no contradiction. Now, so the things of the spirit are the heavenly things. Look at 2 Corinthians. Now, before I move, he calls the glorified body eternal in the heavens. The glorified body. He calls the glorified body that which will swallow mortality. Which will what? Swallow. <laughs> ah, yeah, ta, ta. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I want to do something. Eric, come. Stand here, stand. Immortality is a clot. Every born again child of God has a clot like this that completely covers his entire body from head to leg. So on the resurrection day, those of us that are alive, the immortal body will cover the whole mortality. And in that covering, mortality will disappear. Those that are dead, they will rise 
with the heavenly body, the eternal body. So both the dead and the living will meet in the glorified body. The glorified body has no sickness, no disease. The glorified body is not matter. It doesn't need a plane to go to America. In the glorified body, you think America, you are there. You think Japan, you are there. You think Jupiter, you are there. All you need to do is think it, you are there. In the glorified body, you will walk through people and pass. Matter does not limit the glorified body. Distance does not stop the glorified body. And the glorified body has no pain, no sorrow, no tears. That body is heavenly compared to this body that is earthly. So heaven and earth are terms of description. Heavenly father, different from earthly father. Heavenly body, different from earthly body. Heaven and earth is Moses' term for differentiating from the eternal and the natural. From differentiating from the spiritual pneumaticus from the physical. They are verbages used to distinguish that which is permanent from that which is temporal. So God's heaven is the reality, the eternal reality of Christ in the heart of man. I'm teaching good here. Now I hope you have observed. Eric, you can go and sit. You have finished drinking unction. I hope you have observed that the way Moses taught heaven and earth is the way Jesus taught it. Is the way Paul taught it. And when you corroborate all of these major doctrinal pillars, there is no doctrine without Moses. Moses is the father of doctrine. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Jesus is the reason for doctrine. And when the reason came, he carried Moses' teaching and established it. Then Paul is the spirit of truth that will guide into all the truth concerning what Moses and Jesus taught in a more elaborate verbiage. Am I communicating at all? So there is consistency of theology because truth is consistent. I want to wear my jacket back. Because the heavenly will swallow. <laughs> glory! 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 Now, if you're understanding, shout, I hear, I hear. So he calls that which will swallow immortality. He calls it life. Spirit, life. Let's look at it well. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I will look for somewhere here to stop today. We continue tomorrow. Uh -huh. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Let's start from verse 1. So you, you get the pretext to understand the context. For we know. For we know. Yeah, no man, no God. For we know. Do we know now? For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle we are dissolved. We have. Say we have. When I say you have, what do I mean? It means it's already yours now. Say we have. So it's not heaven at last. Heaven at last is fraud. He didn't say we will have. 
We have a building of God. Some say, you know, Jesus is preparing a mansion for me. <laughs> preparing? That's another religious fraud. And you know those churches where they will tell you, your offering will determine how fast your mansion will finish. That in heaven they are building for you. As if Dangote transporting men to heaven. Then they tell you how many souls you win will determine whether your mansion is finished or it is in a boy's quarter. It, they will even tell you some of you, your heavenly mansion, they never clear ground. Some of you, they are still digging foundation. Work hard, work hard, fast, bring souls, bring money. The more money, the faster the building. They use all that to cajole you and collect your money. It's a lie. Jesus is not building anything anywhere. There is no building going on anywhere. Somebody say, but Dr. Damina, didn't Jesus say, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare, I will come and take you to myself that where I am, you will be. Yes, Jesus said so, but he said so before he died. And remember, another thing Jesus said before he died is destroy this temple. Destroy this temple and in three days. So that thing that Jesus was going to build was going to take how many days? Three days. I will raise it up. And after he rose from the dead, they understood that the temple he was talking about was his body. So when the body was raised up in three days, you are the body of Christ. Jesus is not building anything. He finished building it in his death, burial, and resurrection. And right now, you are the body of Christ. If you're in the building, shout, I hear, I hear. Sit down, let me explain. He built it in three days. And remember, he said that where I am, there you may be. So where he is now is where you are. Where is he? He is in you. Where are you? You are in him. He's together with you. And you can never be separated. Sukatizo. You will never see one without the other. Where he is, I am. What he has, I have. What he can do, I can do. Christ in me, I in Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the gospel of Christ. Is it getting clear? Please sit down so that I can wrap up this. We know. We know. We know that if this our earthly house of this tabernacle we are dissolved, we have Tell your neighbor we have. We have a building. Say, I have a building right now. That building does not need my tight. That building does not need my offering. That building does not need my fasting. It was built before I was born. And I inherited it the day I received Christ. In my father's oikia, there are many monies. Hey. In my father's oikia. That is what that place means. In my father's house are many mansions. If it's English, have you seen a house in a mansion? In a mansion? Huh? Have you ever seen a mansion in a house? A mansion has houses. But no house houses a mansion. So that means that English is not correct. That means it's something else he was talking about. You don't see mansion in a house. In my father's house are many, not even one mansion. You know mansion... So it's not English. So that's why we gave you the Greek rendition. 
in my father's oikia, O-I-K-I-A, are many mones, M-O-N-E. What it means is, in my father's family, family, there are many species. We are a family, and each of us is a space in the father's family. Is it clear? That where I am, there you may be. And today where he is, I'm there. Okay. Let me close this side because the way you guys are going. We have a building of God. Hey. And house. Not made with hands. And where is the house? Eternal where? And we have it. We have it. And it's eternal. And it's in the heavens. But we have it. The only reason why you have what is eternal in the heavens is because you are in the heavens. Look at the next verse. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Next verse. For in this we groan. Oh. Endlessly desiring to be clothed upon with our house. We want to drop this because every time I want to go to London, I need a plane for six hours. But inside me, I know that I have what it takes to appear in London. But this body is limiting me. So I want to drop it so I can wear the other one. So there's a groaning better than this. I know I'm better than this. Next verse. If so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Next verse. For we that are in this tabernacle, mortality, we groan, being burdened, not for that we will be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality may be swallowed up. Which life? Eternal life. Which life? The life of God. Where is it now? In you. That the life of God in you will swallow this body and bring out the reality inside out. Come on. Come on. Hold it, hold it, hold it. <laughs> Glory! 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 You know the Bible says when Christ who is our life shall appear we shall appear. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Tell somebody we shall appear together. Hingo Zawa. Mandolodo Vajaka. Stand up, let's close this service. Hingo Na 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 Brothers and sisters, when you understand this thing I'm saying, you can never be normal. How can you be normal? How can you carry this kind of revelation and be normal? That's why you have tongues. So that when you feel abnormal, you're a Brenda no no ne se keba. Brenda go 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 lo da ba ho. 
Ela na ma, 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 ela na ma. Brenda do dola, ega ba jaka, ega ba joko, ale la ba la ba la ba sakayada. Do not be drunk with wine. Where in his ex? But be filled. Yes. Yeah, Brenna, no, 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 no. That means the symptoms of being physically drunk are similar to the symptoms of being spiritually drunk. Have you ever seen a normal drunkard? is not normal. You will see him walking carefully because he's no more in charge. Some of them small time you will see them do like this. He will look at you and say, you spirit and be normal. That's what we are talking about. You can't be normal. No, 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 no. You can't be normal. And demons don't come near abnormal people. You have to be normal for Satan to want to parley. Satan likes chilling out with normal people. you be loved. Building up your most holy faith. Rising up higher and higher. Like an edifice. Praying in the Holy Ghost. When you pray in the Holy Ghost it's heavenly. How many of you know praying in tongues is heavenly? Can we just express our heavenly identity? Everybody in the building, let's express our heavenly identity. Let's 
shaka, eh gebo shaka, eh gebo shaka, eh la barakata, la barakata, la barakata, la barakata, angama, 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 Bracata, <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, let me add that amen like thunder. Manifest your heavenly status. Function in your authority. Take charge of your world. Whatever does not look like heaven in your life is terminated. Sickness terminated. Disease flushed out. Satan lose your holes. Oppression be broken in the name of Jesus. Let the revelation of your true identity in Christ grow big until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus, great grace is upon you. Great grace is upon you. Enjoy all that Christ has done and live in total victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Can I hear that heavenly amen? amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am the heaven of God. I live in Christ. That's my home address. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, listen carefully. I want to take up your offerings. Every time we teach you the word of God, we're a church that, that works in honor. Honor is our culture as a church. We honor Christ. We honor his word. We honor the labor of God's word. And when we honor, we give. We give willingly. We give sacrificially. It's in our DNA. Giving is part of us. It's generosity. We give very deliberately. You know... Um, I like everybody to package your offerings. And those of you watching online, there are banking details scrolling. You can also do your transfers through the bank accounts on the screen. And uh, our radio audience, in another few minutes, Mr. Michael Bush will read the bank accounts for you from the other studio. And don't forget, tomorrow the fasting continues. I want everybody in church to be here every day through this week as we fast together. You know that the fasting is in the evening. You miss, you stop eating from around 5.30. You start fasting from 6 till 6 in the morning. You break your fast in the morning. And then you can go about your day activity. So it's evening fasting we're doing as a church. And it's for 40 days. Okay, and uh, we're still in it. And every day we come here every day. We meet by 6 to 8 to teach and then to pray every day. God is doing something very, very unusual in our lives. And we want to encourage everybody to be here the whole week from tomorrow till Friday. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot. The most, the most deprived and marginalized man on earth is a man that is ignorant of spiritual realities. He's the most deprived and marginalized. His case is actually hopeless. Bible says he's alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in him. He's the most deprived. So I want to encourage you tomorrow. Quarter to six, we're here. I start teaching by six. And it's every day. Just two hours. And we keep the time. Amen? Then at home, we follow online at nine to ten on direction. Then ten to eleven, we pray. Then you can sleep. Then in the morning, five a.m., we wake up. We join the prayer online till 6 o'clock. Grab your offerings. Let me also use the opportunity to thank those of you that are giving to us our, to us our $100,000 project. And we have between now and the end of the month of January to redeem. I want to thank those of you that are already redeeming yours and those of you that have given. 
And then I also want to mention for those who didn't know but want to be a part of it, you need to send just a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Drabel Damina. Once I get your mail, I will send you banking details that will be relevant to your location so you can send in your support to this project. We're truly excited about serving God with our resources this year more than ever before. So I want to thank all of you. And those of you, like I said, who want to be part of it, remember, somebody gave for you to hear. When you also give, more people will hear. That's what the kingdom is about. All right? Those of you in the building, we're also going to give you that same opportunity just before we close. But lift up your offerings. Father, we give in faith. We give with joy. Our offering is a sweet smell before you today. And we rejoice for the privilege of knowing you and serving you with our resources. In Jesus' name we pray. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Radio audience, we're going to sign you off. But the online people, we are still on with you. If you want to stay with us till we close. But we love you and we expect to see all of you tomorrow at quarter to six as we begin the next service. God bless you. Remember this evening we're live six to eight, nine to ten, ten to eleven, and five to six tomorrow morning. All right, church, we're going to drop the offering anywhere around the pulpit. Hit the music. Let's do it as we give and celebrate. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We love Jesus because the first love God. Hallelujah. You know that I love you. You know that I want to know you so much more. series of this message and all the messages by Dr. Abel Daminer. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.